Welcome to Sweet Home Evangelical Church Online. I'm Pastor Brian, and uh, this is the online service of Sweet Home Evangelical Church. It's one of our three services. We do a, an inside service and an outside service, and this one's online, and we're trying to minister to everybody uh, wherever they're at in this whole pandemic uh, situation here. It is, all of this is strange and different. This weekend is, uh, it was supposed to be Oregon Jamboree weekend. Uh, thousands of country music fans uh, just right over there and all kinds of music and, and noise and chaos in town. That's not happening. And uh, it's just, it's a little strange. Uh, but the good news is God still loves us, right? And God loves you, and thanks for joining us here. I pray that you would be blessed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a, a, just a, a word of prayer, and then I'm going to pray the Lord's Prayer. And, and feel free to say that uh, with me where you're at at home, because that's kind of how we do the Lord's Prayer. We, we say it together as a group. And so join me when I get to the Lord's Prayer, okay? And, and wherever you're at, God is there. Uh, Lord God, we thank you that you are with us. Lord, I thank you for how you have blessed us. In the midst of a pandemic, we really are fairly well off. Uh, there are those who are struggling and hurting, though, and we pray that your hand would be upon them. Pray for our friends who are dealing with health problems. We pray for others dealing with work situations. We pray for the two families uh, uh, here in town of the, the kids hurt in the jet ski accident and just dealing with grief and loss. Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon them. Lord, speak through your word today. Speak through me today. Lord, whoever's watching, wherever they are, whenever they're watching, I pray that they would hear from you and not be listening to just me talking. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, let's see. Last week, I talked about how uh, when I, I got to grow up during a time uh, when there was family camp, uh, family camp for the conference, and lots of denominations and conferences and regional groups did family camp together, and it was great. Um, you know, many people from this church uh, were, went to Jennings Lodge camp, and uh, we had a good time. And uh, the fun thing, I just saw, oh, earlier today, uh, somebody uh, written up about how Jennings Lodge and talk about you know his time at Jennings Lodge back in 1929 so this was going back a ways and it was the end of July uh, for a long 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 time Jennings Lodge family camp for the evangelical churches in Oregon and Washington it would start the last Sunday in July and go through the first Sunday in August and it was like that for years and years and years. And my dad's birthday is today, August 2nd. So that means my dad's birthday almost, almost every year, almost every year. There's just that slight little quirk where August 1st was the Sunday. But almost every year, my dad spent his birthday at family camp at Jennings Lodge. The one year he didn't was the year that we moved. And we were moving from... Uh, Spokane, Washington, uh, clear out to the village of Belfield, North Dakota, and we were unloading our U-Haul on Dad's birthday. Pretty sure that was the deal. And um, oh, and Dad got uh, stung by a bee, and uh, just all kinds of chaos for the guy. Uh, and uh, so that that whole uh, trip to Belfield, we we were sent to start a church. And uh, that was my sophomore year in high school. And, it, and for a while, the Belfield Evangelical Church was going, uh, but it only lasted a season. It just didn't quite work out the way we had hoped. Uh, well, the church was going. We just ended up getting moved, and the church didn't survive after we left. Uh, but, um, you know, that's, that's kind of life, isn't it? Sometimes you, you, you go in with good intentions, but it doesn't quite work out the way you had planned. 
This year, 2020, is a lot like that. We came into 2020 with good intentions, and it's not quite working out the way we had planned. You're watching this video, and some of you watching haven't been in church for months, and it's just kind of dragging on. And there's a disconnect, and there's a loneliness that sets in for some people. Seven months ago, we stayed up late, and our neighbors set off fireworks and, and to celebrate the new year and all of that. We even said to people, Happy New Year. Can you imagine looking back now, uh, saying Happy New Year, it's 2020. Imagine that, you know, looking back now, it just kind of seems more of a sarcastic comment than anything. And we're getting close to five months of coronavirus rules. Uh, the, the word came down this week about schools, and schools aren't going to really open up in-person school uh, this fall uh, coming up uh, next month, and um, it's kind of disappointing. All of this is just kind of chaos. It's changed how kids go to school. It's changed how people work, how people go shopping, how people get health care, how you get a haircut. I need to get a haircut this week. It's not, I'll see if I can get that done. And during times of turmoil, people tend to look at the church for stability. The church has been around for 2,000 years. It should be a place of stability. Yet your church keeps making a bunch of changes just to keep going. And I mean, we're doing church online. We're doing church outside. We change uh, things around inside the building. Everything's changing on us. And all of this is just a bunch of chaos and turmoil. And, and you know, it, I haven't heard it the last few months. Up until... Uh, this year, people would, would say in times of turmoil, they would say things like, everything happens for a reason, right? Well, everything happens for a reason. And I don't, that's not entirely true. And it's also not entirely biblical either. Uh, this this, you know, this everything happens for a reason thing has kind of crept into the church. And I tell you, this side of heaven, there's a lot of things that, that happen, and it doesn't happen according to God's plan and God's will. All through the scriptures, we see people acting out in opposition to God's will. Yet for some reason, this popular little saying, everything happens for a reason, it has come into the church, and so we sit back and we figure, well, I guess it's God's will and God's plan that this happened. And that's not true. You see, God can bring good out of bad situations, but that doesn't mean everything is good. Uh, there was a Disney movie back in the 90s, kind of a good, wholesome movie. Uh, it's called Iron Will. It's kind of hot these days. I probably should watch that again because it's about a young man uh, in a, a sled dog race. And uh, I guess uh, his dad died. And so he's trying to win the sled dog race in order to save the family farm and grit, determination. He's, he's not just will, he's got iron will and he perseveres, wins the race, I think, and saves the day. And we think of, you know, iron will and, and, and some people that imagine God's will as like an iron will, that it is inflexible, it is unbending. And so when a lot of people think about God's will, they think about it with resignation. Like something bad happens in their life, they are in grief and sorrow and someone comes up to them and says, well, everything happens for a reason or it must be God's will. And, and they suffer through difficulty just expecting that it's God's will and they throw up their hands in just fatalistic resignation. Well, I guess it's God's will that everything fell apart here because if anyone has an iron will, it must be God. There are some branches of Christianity 
that emphasize God's will and how God's will is going to happen, whether you like it or not. God's will is this iron will. But the Bible also clearly teaches that God's will is often frustrated. Now, not that God somehow lacks the power to fulfill his will, but that God often chooses to work out his purposes in a way that respects the free will that he gave to human beings, which sometimes I don't think was a great idea. You see, that's why God didn't get rid of Adam and Eve after they rebelled against him in the Garden of Eden. And you see, although God is certainly powerful enough to override human freedom at any moment, God chooses not to. God prefers instead to allow us a measure of freedom and at the, you know, at the same time working out his plans and working things out for good in spite of our stubborn resistance and our really dumb decisions. So although God's ultimate plan is sure to come to pass, God's will is often frustrated by people. People and circumstances can be frustrating at times, can't they? Oh, my word. People and circumstances, we are all suffering from COVID fatigue these days. And there are some people who are just not pleasant to be around. Everybody has opinions. It is, I'm telling you, it is painful for me to be on social media and see people say just stuff that's not true. It's, it's a wild exaggeration, if anything. And to just, just stay out of it and let them say it because I'm not going to change their mind anyway. I mean, people have all kinds of ideas and they, they, they vary in range. And there's a lot of things that are trying to divide us these days. One of those things is wearing a mask. Uh, it, it, it is. It's, it's becoming a divisive issue. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, videos on the internet. Uh, there was a, a lady with her two small children in, in a grocery store and her kids didn't wear masks because in that state you don't have to wear a mask if you're under 10. So her little girls weren't wearing masks and this lady was yelling at her, saying, you're trying to kill me. Uh, I saw another video of a couple having a picnic at a picnic table outside, nobody's around, except one lady just saw them, they're not wearing a mask while they're having a picnic at a picnic table, and so she walks up to them and sprays mace on them. I mean, it is getting insane. And, and there is the side that says, hey, if you're not wearing a mask, you're trying to kill grandma, you're a horrible person. And then the other side that says, if you're wearing a mask, that's just the government trying to gag you and control you, and it's basically the mark of the beast. And I, I like to think that the truth is somewhere in the middle there, okay? We're trying to be careful and respectful and not be mask bullies around people. And, and people, you know, they, they don't always react in a pleasant way all the time. They just don't. And sometimes people don't react in a godly way. And we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer, to, uh, and we're looking at it again today, and I just remembered I forgot to say the Lord's Prayer at the end of the prayer at the beginning. And, and so we probably should do that here. We've been in the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. We started in December. We went up through March, took a break at Easter, and then we did uh, Armor of God. And now we're in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. When we wrap up Sermon on the Mount, I think we're going to do something Old Testament. I'm, I'm leaning towards uh, Nehemiah, but all options are on the table because life keeps changing on us. Uh, but we're, we're, we're looking at the Lord's Prayer. And so let's stop and pause and just say the Lord's Prayer together with me. Uh, we pray as the Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot that earlier, but, you know, this is just like real church where I forget things and, and we charge ahead. But we're looking at the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer, like I said last week, it's not a recipe where you recite these magic words. It is a pattern, and it's good to go over this outline or this pattern of prayer. And we come to the part of the prayer today that we're focusing in on is, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, if you don't speak King James, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, God's kingdom and God's will. That's what we're talking about today. And they're kind of in the same ballpark, but a little different. We don't use the word kingdom uh, these days. Uh, we live in America. We are in a kingdom. We don't use kingdom. If we use kingdom, uh, we are talking about like, the United Kingdom, or the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, or the Magic Kingdom at Disneyland. Uh, and uh, in, in, in all of these, when we talk about kingdom, it is a specific place. It's an address. There's GPS coordinates on this. And it is a place that has defined borders, especially the Magic Kingdom. My word, they got a wall and you got to pay to get in there. But in, in the Greek word for kingdom is a little different. Uh, in the Bible, the, the emphasis isn't on the place, it is on the rule or the reign of God. And so some Bible translations, when they, when they translate, uh, instead of using the term kingdom of God, some uh, Bible translations will say the reign of God or the rule of God, just to bring out this idea that when we're talking about kingdom, we're not talking about a, a, an address, a specific geographical location. And Jesus talks a lot about God's kingdom and God's reign. He taught stories called parables to illustrate what God's kingdom was like. Yet, he also taught that God's kingdom wouldn't come with power and authority until his second coming. And you can read all about his second coming in the Bible or those left behind books uh, written by the guys. And we got a bunch back there in the uh, uh, church library. Uh, now you might picture the God's kingdom this way. In Jesus's first coming, he established God's kingdom. Uh, he opened the doors of God's kingdom. He invited people to come through those doors by trusting in his death and in his resurrection. He warned us that unless we are born again through faith in him, we can't enter into the kingdom. So God's kingdom reign is established in some way through Jesus' first coming. Yet, it's only when Jesus comes at the end of the age when God's kingdom reign will be fully achieved. I, I, you know, I used to like uh, going to the bank, going inside the bank. I don't like doing the drive through I don't like doing drive through because you just sit there. I mean, you're, you're going to run out of gas sometimes if you wait and drive through forever. Uh, but uh, I like going inside the bank uh, because on Fridays uh, they would do... Um, uh, my bank would give away free cookies, so I'd save my banking for Fridays, of course, because free cookies. And, uh, and now I, I don't do that. I just go to the ATM, and it didn't matter if I go inside or use the ATM. Uh, either way, they let you know when you, when you deposit a check, those funds aren't available for another day or two until that check clears. Okay, so... And, and we know this, you've all had this. When Jesus came, Jesus wrote the check. He wrote the check of God's kingdom. And when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he handed you the check so that you could be a citizen of God's kingdom. And in some ways, this life, it is just 
waiting. We're in that waiting period for the check to clear. And the way things are going, it wouldn't surprise me if the Lord's return didn't happen real soon. Who knows? Every year I kind of, I look out for um, the Jewish feast of Rosh Hashanah. That's kind of my marker. I don't know if that's uh, going to happen this year, but I feel like we are closer to the Lord's return than ever before. It might be this year. It might be a hundred years from now. Who knows? But someday, God's kingdom is going to be established here on earth as it is in heaven in the sense of abolishing evil and vindicating good. And so we live in this time of tension between the, the already part of God's kingdom and the not yet part. We're in this just time in between of, of, uh, uh, of waiting for the check to clear. And some Bible scholars, they do call this tension the already and the not yet. Through Jesus, our sins are already forgiven. But because of the not yet, we still struggle with temptation uh, of sin in our lives, occasionally failing and falling. Through Jesus, our salvation is already guaranteed. We are promised complete healing and restoration when Christ comes again. But because of the not yet, our bodies still get sick. And we still struggle with fears and doubts. Already, the powers of evil and darkness are defeated by Jesus through the, his death and resurrection. And, and so, but because of the not yet, there is evil and darkness that still exists here on earth. So when we pray, your kingdom come, we're not asking for that already part. But we are looking forward to the not yet part. That part when God's kingdom reign will come here on earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Okay, so now God's kingdom and God's will, they look at the same situation from two different perspectives. Think of God's kingdom as like the really, the big picture stuff, okay? We're talking like telescopes looking at galaxies all across the universe. And, and that is God's kingdom. God's kingdom power over all his creation. So the phrase God's kingdom, it looks at the big picture. It looks at the big universal picture here. But think of God's will as looking at the same thing from a smaller perspective like a microscope. Uh, God's will is God's power in a specific circumstance in life. God's will is God's kingdom applied to a circumstance or to a particular community or to a particular individual. Now, as followers of Jesus, we are called to live under God's reign in his kingdom, even though his kingdom has yet to arrive here on earth in power. We seek to live our lives by the values of God's rule and reign, even though we live in occupied territory here on earth. A number of years ago, uh, the nation of Laos is right next to Vietnam, uh, out there in Southeast Asia, and the kings of Laos and the kings of Vietnam had disputed territory in the borderlands for years and years. And, and they, they never, it took them a while, but they finally figured out how, to, you know, how are we going to figure this out here? Because, you know, they, they didn't, um, they needed to figure out which residents were Laotian and which residents were Vietnamese. Uh, of course, you have to do this for tax purposes, I suppose, but they didn't build a fence, they didn't set up border patrol, they didn't issue passports, but they did need to figure out who belonged to which country. So their plan was fairly simple. And here it comes. Those who ate short grain rice, built their houses on stilts, and decorated their homes with Indian-style serpents, they were considered Laotian. Uh, those who ate long grain rice, built their homes on the ground, decorated their homes with Chinese-style dragons, they were considered Vietnamese. 
even though they lived in the same geographical area, their kingdom allegiance was determined by the values they embraced. Their kingdom allegiance was determined by the values they embraced. So as followers of Jesus, our ultimate allegiance is to God's reign, and we seek to live by kingdom values in his world today. Even though we live as Americans, we seek to be good, responsible citizens in our nation, our ultimate loyalty is to God's reign as our king. The kingdom we belong to will be seen by the values and the culture that we embrace. The Lord's Prayer, it came out of Jesus' own prayer life. Uh, when I think of, uh, of praying, thy will be done. I think about Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion and execution on the cross. Jesus went to this private place to pray. It, 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 uh, essentially, it's just a, a, an orchard of olive trees. And uh, he went there to pray, took his disciples with him, and uh, then he took his three closest friends a little farther, and he said, Hey, guys, I, I need you to pray for me. I desire, I, I want you, I need you to pray for me. And then he went a little further to pray, and of course, his friends, they fell asleep pretty much immediately. And Jesus, he prayed, and, and it says at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. What we find here is this conflict between Jesus' human nature and God the Father's will. Jesus knows what lies ahead of him. He knows the suffering, the pain, the isolation from his friends and from his, his God. You see, Jesus' death isn't merely the death of a martyr who's dying for a cause. The death of Jesus is about to die is a unique kind of death, a death where he dies as a substitute, taking on himself all the consequences for all of our sin, all of our mistakes, all of our failures. And Jesus knows he's about to experience the judgment of God on the sinfulness of humanity in his death. Jesus knows he's about to be forsaken by his friends and family. He's about to undergo terrible physical suffering at the hands of professional Roman executioners. He knows he's about to be totally alienated from his God as he experiences the full weight of God's judgment against human sinfulness. And so he cries out to the Father for another way, some other method to accomplish the same goal, some other way to offer forgiveness and restoration for the human race. Yet at the end, he concludes... But not as I will, but your will be done. In a very real sense, he prayed, Father, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. Even though the will of God came at great personal cost for himself. You see, in heaven, God's kingdom rule is supreme. And absolute. In heaven, God's will is done immediately and without question. Yet here on earth, we pray for God's kingdom. We look forward to the establishment of God's kingdom. We look forward to being with God in heaven, right? Yet we, we live here on earth, and we are to live by those kingdom values here on earth. We are praying for God's will to be done, and we want God to fix this world, don't we? There's a lot of things on our list that, God, you got to fix this. you got to fix this. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. There's uh, violence in the streets. There are riots. There are corrupt politicians. 
oh, there's a worldwide pandemic. There's all of our own personal problems and issues. I mean, God, you got to fix all of this. Yet, when we pray for God's will to be done, we are surrendering our will. We are turning in our list of things that we want God to do. And we are saying, God, not my will, not my plan, not my preference, but your will be done. Sometimes life just seems like a random sequence of events. Sometimes people are living their lives outside of God's will. But when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we're praying that God's will would be done, that's a decision that we're making. We're saying, God, I know that you've given us free will and we can oppose you. We can make stupid choices. We can choose to follow you or to deny you and follow our own evil desires, our own stupid desires. But God, I'm choosing to follow you. I will not be the reason that your will is not done here on earth. I will not be that reason. My will is going to take a back seat to your will being done here on earth. My will is, is not important. Your will. Your will be done. I'm going to live by the values of your kingdom. And I'm going to follow your will in every circumstance of my life as best as I can. Everyone's familiar with the, the word amen. Uh, when I get done preaching in church, uh, there's a number of people after I say amen, other people say amen. I think it's actually really cool uh, that I finish, I say amen, everybody else says amen. I, you know, it's, it's, it's really awesome. And, but have you ever taken time to consider what that word amen means? Amen is a universally recognized word that is far more significant than just signing off your prayer. And uh, by saying, you know, 10 4 over and out or something like that. With the word amen, we are in effect saying, may it be so in accordance to the will of God. Amen is a small word that in essence is saying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I am all for it, God, whatever you want. Amen, amen, amen. Can you say amen with me? We live in a, just this crazy upside down world. Uh, we're, we're all trying to figure it out. Uh, I, um, I'm trying to figure it out. But when we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we are saying, I'm not, it's not going to be because of me that God's will isn't done here on earth. Oh, we know God's will is not being done here on earth. We can see that by watching the news, but it's not going to be because of me. God, may your will be done in my life. I will follow you. Have you said amen to God today? Will you say yes to God? Let me pray for you. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd bless those who are watching. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would surround them, that you'd be with them that your grace would be upon them right now, wherever they are, whenever they're watching, that your will would be done in their lives, that they could say yes to you, that they could say, amen, God. I am all in on your will. I want your will done in this world, in this life. And I turn it all over to you, Lord. I pray that we could all say that your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for sticking with me this long into the video. Uh, I pray that the Lord would bless you today, uh, that God's grace would surround you, that we could, we could really feel God's presence as we try to live according to God's kingdom values here on earth, that we can say yes to God and whatever that comes across our way this day and this week. Lord bless you, my friends. Have a great week. Bye-bye.